We're going to spend about half an hour setting, uh, setting some scene around where I believe EQC is at, um, more generally on land program and then specifically on increased flooding vulnerability. Uh, Dave Townsend, who's sitting behind me, is then going to do a presentation on increased flooding vulnerability and how DOV, or diminution in value, works in practice. So there's quite a lot of information. Uh, some of the slides are going to be a bit difficult to see, particularly on a screen of this size from that distance. So as Brian said, they will be available afterwards. Um, most of the slides I'm going to use, um, I've used before, and a number of you will have seen them before, uh, but I think they just set the context. But this evening is about IFV and DOV, so I'll try and keep my comments reasonably short. Uh, so this is the introduction. Um, I put up this slide for two reasons. Um, one, from an EQC perspective, I think it is important that we do have some balance. Um, from a property viewpoint, most properties have been resolved by EQC, but I'm not going to stand here and skite about that. There are still a lot to go, and some of them are really difficult, and you know that. That's why you're sitting here. Um, but there has been some significant progress on nearly 180,000 properties over the last four years. The bottom right uh, pie chart is the one that I have responsibility for. So we're about 80% of the way through land claims, and I can talk a bit more about what that means in practice. But realistically, it means we still have 20% to go. Uh, and that's a lot of people, including yourselves. So when I say we've got 20% of our land claims still to go, that's approximately 25,000 customers. And I don't underestimate that at all. That's a lot of people. We've made a lot of commitments, both within EQC and also publicly, that we're going to get the bulk of those claims settled this year. That's a big ask. Uh, so what I'd like to do is help share with you this evening how we're going to deal with um, IFV specifically. However, on increased liquefaction vulnerability, which will be of interest, I'm sure, to some of you as well, um, I've put up the definition purely because I think it puts context around the subject. All I can say this evening on ILV is we're not as far advanced as I would like us to be. Uh, we do not yet have a policy which has been approved for EQC to settle ILV claims. We're working on that, and I hope to have that soon. If you ask me exactly when, I'm not going to answer the question because I don't know. What I do know is there are about six or 7,000 uh, customers who've got potential ILV damage on their property and they deserve some answers as to whether that applies and how we're going to settle them. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, we work closely with the Community Advocacy Group, or CAG. Uh, some of the people who are on CAG are sitting in the room this evening, uh, but that includes Cancern, it includes the ESCs, it includes Age Concern, and they've been really supportive and helpful in terms of how we're going to position what we're doing on ILV going forward. Uh, we should have an update out to all customers um, saying mid-year, so I think saying later this month is probably optimistic. It's probably more likely to be into June. Increased flooding vulnerability, on the other hand, uh, we have made some progress since I last met with a number of the people in the room here. Um, I'm putting up the definition for the video uh, so that we've got the context of what we're talking about here. Uh, so this is a new form of land damage. It's never been dealt with before, not in New Zealand or anywhere else in the world for that matter, on the scale we're talking about. As a consequence of that, it's taken time to produce policy and settlement routes, which we believe are both fair, but we can also um, now deal with reasonably quickly. So I won't talk about that slide in any more detail. Uh, for those of you who came to a hub we had back in October last year, uh, we had representatives from Tonkin and Taylor and uh, Matt sitting here this evening from TNT, uh, who talked through the engineering assessment processes that we've used at EQC to determine whether properties qualify for IFV from an engineering viewpoint. Uh, so you will recognise these slides if you were at that hub, and they are uh, pretty much uh, available to people. So complex engineering assessment um, has been done and for clarity Dave and the valuers don't get into the DOV discussion we're about to have unless a property passes through the engineering assessment. Uh, 
I think a number of people in the room might have gone to the declaratory judgment last year in October, four days of riveting legal discussion, uh, but four days of important legal discussion to ensure that what EQC was proposing to do on IFV was firstly legal, uh, and it also gave some affirmations about the approach we were planning to take on IFV. Um, the hearing was in October, the results came out in December, there was an appeal period to the end of January. Uh, thankfully at the end of January there were no appeals and therefore we were able to proceed on the basis that we had set out to do. Uh, which has meant that EQC has been settling IFV land claims for customers from about the middle of March and so far feedback has been good. Um, I'm not going to share too much because it is still early days. Uh, we've committed publicly to settling the bulk of IFV claims by the end of this year and given that we sent out 10,000 letters last year to customers who potentially have IFV, that's how many people we need to contact between now and the end of the year. And the reason we will be contacting 10,000 is whether people have a confirmed yes or they have a confirmed no, uh, we will be sending them a detailed settlement pack and we will be calling them to talk through that settlement pack so they understand the decision that's been made. The other thing I'd like to stress is all of those decisions are completely available for review. Uh, people can take the settlement money and still review, they can review before whichever part of the process they want to be involved in. So, that's where we are on IFV. The bulk of claims will be settled on the basis of diminution in value, and that's primarily because it is really difficult to get a feasible and consentable repair for IFV damage. So we reckon about 90% of our claims that are being settled will be settled on the basis of DOV. Hence why Dave's here this evening and hence why I think this is important to share with you. Um, as I said, Dave Townsend, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Valuers. Um, I've had quite a long involvement in, you might call it post-disaster work, um, on a valuation basis with the Earthquake Commission. Um, i in private practice based in the Bay of Plenty, but uh, I have been following various disasters around the country, unfortunately. Um, when we came down here for this segment for IFV, um, EQC charged and said, well, how do you do it? And basically it's never been valued um, extensively in the world before because there's no insurance policy that actually covers what this payment is for. So it was somewhat unique. We uh, formed a team of valuers and we, uh, with Chris Bridges over here from Market Valuation in Christchurch and also Ken Blucher out of, Auck out of Wellington, a director of Derricks, and we set to, to develop a methodology <laughs> Um, it really comes back to that definition of IFV. This is both a legal and also a valuation surrounding it. It's just to remember it's a discount in the price that would have been paid for a property on the day before the earthquake sequence started. Having full knowledge of all the, uh, the what has happened to the property. And that, that's quite significant, that full knowledge. Um, so. We're, we're working on it on the basis that, that everybody is aware of what happened, which is not what is happening in the market. Um, there's a number of underlying assumptions that we have to include in our assessment. That's that insurance and finance will be available. When we first started out in 2011, I think if you remember back then, you couldn't buy a house unless there was an insurance package with it or finance package. Um, We've come a long way since then and in our, invest, our discussions with insurance companies and the finance companies have indicated that you know, business as usual will come back into play. And so we are taking it on the basis that that will be available. The knowledge I've covered off, the DOV only reflects IFV damage. There's a variety of other damage that's happened to property, um, but we are not assessing it in this circumstance. In the other situations we are, it, it's included in, in the, the other EQC settlement packages, but DOV is exclusively around the damage caused by the increased flooding vulnerability. We're also assuming when we do our individual properties that the properties either side have been repaired, the, the stormwater is up to scratch, um, and the short and medium term stigma has gone. 
the, I'll cover the stigma issue. When after the event, there's a period when there's very little demand for purchasing properties. People are worried about life and health issues. The market value, if you like, would have dropped right away. There's a period as it gradually knowledge comes back into the market and people realise what it's going to cost to fix or repair. The price starts continuing back up. It eventually, um, from around the world studies, we've seen you know seven years as a uh, when the markets generally get back to where they were tracking. Um, we're trying to work out the bit before when the when the stigma goes up until there's a there's a gap between that and the, what the market is for a couple of years. That's the bit we're trying to work out here. How much that increased flooding vulnerability has discounted the price somebody would have paid for the property. And the last one is the non-insured land excluded. That's land under the Earthquake Commission Act that's further than 8 metres from the dwelling or a pertinent structure or 60 metres on the driveway. In the normal residential situation, it's a very limited impact on the overall value of the property. It might be the corner. If you measured from 8 metres out, it might just be there, which is not a major impact. Most of the value of the property is related under the house and then the drive and then the immediate surrounds of the property and then the, the value d diminishes as you move away from the dwelling. One of the things that uh, is sometimes hard to grasp is off-site influences have to be excluded. Um, the Earthquake Commission Act doesn't cover them. It only covers for damage that occurred on the property itself. So the fact that the stormwater is not operating as it used to or that the rivers haven't the same carrying capacity as they used to is excluded. That portion of the flooding has been excluded through the engineering work and so we are only valuing the damage that's actually occurred to that property and the increased flooding as a result of that. Um, valuers, we, we turn to the market. Um, this, the whole thing basis is, is a market based valuation. We went and looked at the uh, various flooding areas around New Zealand and there's, there's quite a number of them and they've had repeated floods. We looked there at what the houses were selling for in the flood areas and what they were selling for just outside the flood areas, trying to get this discount. So we just work out what, you know, and what in, impacted on it. One of the first things we found that uh, ponding water is not seen as bad by purchasers as fast flowing water which is, has a health and safety, you know, life and limb, you could get swept away. So if a, if a river flooded through a place, there was quite a dramatic drop in values compared to if just water ponded on, around the property. We undertook a quite an extensive case study on the Upper Heathcote River. Um, this area has had tradition of flooding periodically. We looked at properties in, within that had flooded and one similar properties where we believe wouldn't have flooded and tried to get the price differential because flooded properties sell regularly, just like any other property. So there's quite a bit of um, information we get from that. We also undertook a post-sale questionnaire. We interviewed about uh, 250 people after they'd sold or purchased and we're trying to get the basis of what they looked at. Um, these were basically properties on the edge of the red zone. Um, so quite severely affected from both an IFV and an ILV perspective. Just seeing what information they had, how they used it, what costs they had, and what were their underlying reasons. This was all building up to, a, um, to try and get this percentage reductions. We also had um, an extensive review of the local and also international literature around um, both flood disasters, earthquake, um, contaminated land issues, the discount in price, etc. that occurred in those. So there's quite a bit of worldwide literature on these. And we used all that to develop a, a matrix of percentage reductions that we believe would be relevant. We then went out and tested these percentage reductions, we'd value the properties and then we'd get somebody to value them as if they weren't in a flood zone, just to see what the difference would be. And we did that quite extensively. We had to change some of our initial opinions, but they came through. And we also undertook ground truthing. So in the event um, of those floods last year, we would go out and check where the, um, our 
engineering information that was being fed to us was saying that the flood water should have got to was actually um, true. And in the end, we've now come away with a very firm um, knowledge that the data we, we're basing it on, the engineering data, is sound. There was some the additional data we had available. We had the market sales evidence. There's, there's been transactions continuing in Christchurch. There's been contractions elsewhere. We had the engineering site assessment where the engineers had done um, a property inspection on most of the properties. We had the LIDAR survey, the plane flying over and giving us the heights of the land so we could work out, well, the engineers could work out where it had dropped. And that LIDAR survey feeds into the flood maps, which is a central part of this. It gives us little five metre grids of what, where the height has gone in the land over the various events. Because in some events it went up and some it went down, we have taken it as a single entity right from the 3rd of um, September right through to the 23rd of December 2010. We've taken it as one event. Um, otherwise it was going to be too, um, some of the changes were too small to actually be accurate on. So this, uh, taking it as one, it gives a more balanced look. We also had um, the EQC mud map, um, which is just basically a site sketch that was done while the people visited each of those sites. So our registered valuers won't be going on site. They'll be doing it from the roadside, but they'll have the information that's been provided to them by one or two visits by people. Uh, they'll also have a lot of other data. The valuers, in fact, will have a, a pack of each one of these of about 21 pages as they go from property to property. This all came to the matrix. This, we're, we're, we're thinking here we've got 20 values in the field. They're doing the, the pre-valuation, all right, that's a, that's a traditional method. They're then coming up with this. To, so to maintain consistency across Christchurch for varying flood heights or varying impacts, we went to this matrix of the percentages as we'd found as we went along. This is to, um, just to make sure we have somebody who's on, been on one side of town is working on the same basis as somebody on the other side. So basically you have up on the y-axis up here a description of what the flood was like. Um, basically it, it starts off a minimal flood down the back, of, flooding the back of your property. The change there, it wouldn't really worry you too much. This is on, based on a 1 in 100 years, so if the corner back of your property flooded, no really big issue. It wouldn't impact, we believe it wouldn't impact on your value. As it gets closer to your dwelling, definitely the impact increases. When it goes under your dwelling, that's a big step. Then when it goes through your floorboards, an even bigger step. And they're all percentage drops we're talking about and what the, the price likely be paid for the property. And then as we talked about that health and safety issue, a smaller flood waters have an impact, but once they start getting bigger, they start getting more unreliable, they, the, you could be swept away once they get over you know, half a metre, they're becoming more and more significant. So to keep the values on a consistent basis, they, so on this side of town to that side, we've got this matrix they work to. We were then looked and we saw that if a property floods more as a result of the Christchurch or the Canterbury earthquake sequence, there should be an increase in the discount for that. So if a property previously flo um, flooded uh, once in 100 years but not once in 50, we felt if it now floods in that 50, they should, that should be recognised as another discount. And, ev and even more so if it floods 1 in 10 now, whereas it didn't previously. So we have this here, we, the, the two columns here. One is for uh, um, the more minor flooding outside the building platform and the other larger percentage is where the, uh, the building platform is impacted upon. And then another issue that gave us some time to sort out was the fact that in some areas, if you have a, a property with a lakefront or a seafront, um, as we study these around the country, people sort of overlooked the flooding issue to some extent. They were prepared to put up with it. If they looked on a great view it, over that water, they tended to discount that, you know, the, the impact that that property could detrimentally affect their property. 
So they, we had to take a, another wee discount off there. This won't be that common on that many properties, but there will be a few properties um, with great river views or in the really high value areas where there's a very strong demand to get into there. The flooding impact is not so significant because quite often it's also um, covered in the design of the dwellings that go on there. So, how's DAV calculated? We start the register value, we'll go out there and establish a pre-quake value. That's a, a value before the 3rd of September 2010. That's both the insured land area plus the buildings plus the chattels. So what he believes or he or she believes that that property would have sold for back then. Then they go to the matrix and determine the discount that should be used based on the flood maps, which we'll come to shortly. They apply the discount to that pre-quake value, but most importantly, then they step back and say, well, as a valuer, does that look right? Is, am I happy with the solution that's coming up there? And that is probably one of the most crucial parts of the, the whole thing. Right, um, this was new. It was very new. Um, so we took it to our institutes, which is an institute of New Zealand Institute of Values and the New Zealand Property Institute, and said, please provide us with a panel of um, experienced value values that we can run this past to see how they feel about it. So we had, they put this panel, which included the then president of the institute, um, had an academic in, in the form of Dr. Sandy Bond, who's a professor of property studies at Lincoln, and two very experienced values, one in Auckland, one in Wellington, and Gary Sellers in, uh, in Christchurch here has a long history of um, work in right across the Canterbury area and also in international valuation standards. He's been very active in that area. So we were trying to get a, our methodology to a position where we had a standard so valuers could work to it. We also went through the declaratory judgment and that was also a proving ground for the, our methodology. So how it basically works, the valuer has these two pages they're out in the field with, we'll just quickly run through them. Half it's filled in before they get there. There's a lot of sort of basic data they have to fill in. But one of the things is, there's a valuer doing it and there's also, it's being reviewed by somebody who's got all the data in front of them in an office situation and there's almost a conversation goes on. The valuer puts one thing and then the reviewer, when on their review, can say, well, yeah, I agree with you or did you consider this or that? Because no two floods are the same. Every property looks different. And so this, two, this constant reviewing system, we, we believe, is, is an even good security that they'll be more likely to be accurate. So the, the, the reviewer will, or the valuer will have comments in here each time and so there'll be almost conversation going backwards and forwards at times. The, this is probably more relevant to many people. This is for total disclosure. If somebody wants a review of their assessment, this pack will go out to them with also a, a, probably an eight page how to read it. But this, this has been quite useful because here, this is the sales that occurred pre-September 2010 that the valuer has used. Remembering these valuers are doing a property as it was four and a half years ago. So it's very useful. People will find this quite useful to have this. There's also, we have a database that was um, sort of Groundhog Day stopped back in 2010, so it doesn't renew. These photos will all be off that era of when that house was back there in 2010. Just more background so the people can see it, because sometimes the, uh, the customer wasn't the owner at the time. There's typical valuation standard to get to the market value. There's just four approaches. Um, this will be available so they can go through it, they can see how their value did it, they can say yes I agree or they didn't agree, or they might actually have a valuation from 2009 or 10. That could be very useful in a review process. And then in the end, there's the, the, the reviewer's final comments saying, yes, I agree with that or not. And quite often this can go backwards and forwards a number of times, or as they get more used to it, it, it tends to go through less times. So, this, so we're now getting to sort of the, the crutch of this is the flood maps, which are produced by the engineers. This is showing the exacerbation that's occurred as a result of the Canterbury earthquake sequence 
in a 1 in 100 years situation. The darker the colour generally means the deeper the flooding. And so we'll go on, that's the 1 in 100 we're trying to get to. This is pre the earthquake sequence, typical street. Quite often you can see it's in blue, so quite deep. That was many of the uh, Christchurch streets are uh, designed to be overland flow paths. So that is of no impact. We're looking at the site here. What we can see is there's a bit of um, 100, 200 millimetre flooding, but there's also this area here which it could be 300 to 500 millimetres deep. Now we know from both the engineers and also our roadside inspection, this property's foundations are only 300 millimetres. So before the earthquake sequence, this property was flooding inside. Some water was getting in and at least that 5 by 5 square metre in the middle of the dwelling. After the event, the property is sunk. The water is moved now in the, in the event of a 1 in 100, it's moved onto the site. So we're now seeing a substantially wetter property. We go to the, the change and probably the most significant in the middle here, there's a a square that's showing the property has sunk by you know 300 to 500 millimetres. It's now being flooded by that much. So we, we'd go back to the matrix. We would work up this side to see what the flood was like. We get up here and it says previously it used to flood around the dwelling, over the site, under the dwelling and also enter it. So we'd go along that, that sequence and we'd come over here because it's now flooding a bit more. This is the increase in flooding between 0.3 to 0.5, so we're saying that's 8% increase on that property or an 8% decrease between the market value as of 2010 and what it would sell for the day after. We then look at the that frequency issue we discussed. This is the 1 in 50. We saw that it, the property used to flood in the 1 in 50. We then look at the 1 in 10. We see that the flood waters used to get on. They'd get into the garage down here, so there was no additional increase and uh, decrease for that impact. The fact that this property is next to a boatyard doesn't mean it was on a river. It, it, it wouldn't have got anything extra taken off it for in that area. So we get to it. Our value has gone out there based on that valuation worksheet. They've assessed the value of 220,000 back as of September 2010. That's for the land, buildings and chattels. Through the matrix, it indicates an 8% reduction and that's of 220,000 is 17,600. On the valuers review, he's gone through the water previously into the dwelling, now it enters it more so. The dwelling was also wet pre the two and 10% events. That's one in 50 and one in 10 year events. So he's concluded that 17,600 reduction on this property is fair and reasonable. So he's saying that the property would sell for just over 200,000 now. Um, basically, the valuations are completed with the, the best engineering advice we have available. In accordance with the EQC Commission Act, which is quite significant because otherwise they, you know, they owe the opportunity to overturn them via the reinsurers, etc. The valuation methodology has been approved by a panel of valuers, appointed by the New Zealand Institute of Valuers and the Property Institute. The valuations are completed by local experienced private valuers. They're working for us two days a week. For the other three days a week, they're out there in the marketplace working on their, their normal jobs. All valuers are employed and appointed completely independently of EQC. And all the valuations are peer reviewed. 